So welcome to this video about the gene's length and how to derive it. But first, we're actually just going to have a quick look at what the gene's length actually is. So the definition of the gene's length or the radius is the radius of a cloud where the thermal expansion energy is counteracted by gravitational forces. So this would cause the cloud to collapse. So it's a balance between the internal expansion energy, the pressure, and the gravitational energy trying to collapse it. And if the radius is below that or above that, then it's not going to be stable. So we're going to work out a value or an expression for this gene's length for a cloud of interstellar gas. So giant molecular clouds is where we think this star forming is occurring. So this is what it relates to. So if we had a, a cloud of gas of some size, it's going to relate to these molecular clouds. And these molecular clouds are cold enough and dense enough to favour the formation of molecules, which is why they're called giant molecular clouds. Now, the Orion Nebula uh, is a pretty good example of one which has undergone some star formation. So I've just highlighted a couple of stars there that are bright blue. So these are quite young, large stars that are formed within that nebula. So we know that the star forming is occurring there, but how does it happen? And what sort of size cloud does it occur at? So the, the genes criteria only considers the gravitation and thermodynamics, really, and the collapse is going to happen when this internal gas pressure is weaker than the gravitational force trying to collapse it. So you've got an expression here, an equation. So on the left-hand side, you've got the pressure gradient. So this is the pressure at some radius of the cloud. And then on the right-hand side, you have the gravitational force at some radius. And obviously your mass is the mass enclosed at that radius. And then you have your density of the cloud at that radius. So this is the starting point, really. And it's the only thing that it actually considers. So we will... Make it nice and simple by assuming a spherical cloud and assuming that it's stable, which means it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, the gravitational forces and the gas pressures are going to be equal. So they're balancing one another out. That spherical cloud is stable, so it's not going to collapse. It's not going to expand. And this is the point we want to work out the gene's length. Now, at some point the pressure may no longer balance that gravitational force trying to collapse it. So it becomes unstable and it begins to collapse. So that gravitational force overcomes the gas pressure and it starts to collapse. Now that typically would be a runaway contraction. So it will continue to collapse until some other force prevents that collapse. So I suppose if we're talking about the collapse of a cloud of interstellar gas and it's collapsing to a star, at some point it's going to heat up to the point where that internal pressure is going to balance that gravitational force, so then it will reach a new equilibrium point. So what we're going to do is, starting with this spherical cloud of gas, it's going to have some radius r and some mass m. So that is our starting point. We've got this sphere of gas with radius r and mass m. Now, to do this, we need to actually start with a virial theorem. Now, this is an equation which relates the average total kinetic energy over time for a stable system consisting of n particles bound by potential forces, which is the gravitational force in this case here. So, on the, so the, the K is your kinetic energy of the gas, and the U is your gravitational potential energies. So, we've got our gas kinetic energy for the K, and we've got our gravitational potential energy for our U. And we can basically put those into the equation and then we can arrange for some value R. But it's not as straightforward as that to start with because our gas kinetic energy has an N in there, which is the number of particles in that cloud of gas. Now that doesn't make a great lot of sense when we're looking at a real cloud. So we might want to turn that into something that's more useful. So, for example, we want to put that kinetic energy in terms of the radius and the density of that cloud. So if we think about the number of particles in a cloud, it's going to relate to its radius, its density, the mass of an individual particle and the mean mass of those particles, which is what we have. So once we've considered that and exchanged the N and put it in terms of the radius and density, we can have that expression on the right. And then we can basically tidy it up and 
the final expression for the kinetic energy is given at the bottom in the yellow. So that's what we want to put back into that equation. Now we also want to do the same thing for the gravitational potential energy as well. So we want to put it in terms of radius and density and take that mass out. So we can then rewrite that in terms of radius and density because we know how mass, radius and density all relate to one another. It's a sphere. So if we remember that, we just exchange the mass for the radius and density there. And then we get this expression at the bottom. So now we've got these two new equations we could then go put back into our theorem. So we can go and do that and then we can then equal them to one another. So because we've got a negative gravitational potential energy, it means that our 2k is going to basically equal um, minus u, which then becomes positive. So at the top there, we've put them in and we've equaled them to one another. Now, if we divide through by the radius cubed, the density and pi, we can simplify it a little bit. And now we're left with the expression at the bottom, which has a radius and density on the right hand side, and then you've got your temperature on the left hand side. All the other ones are going to be constants. So now we can rearrange for that R, and that is our gene's radius or our gene's length. So now we've got an expression that's going to tell us the radius at which the the pressures and the gravitational potential energies are going to balance one another out. And it relates to the temperature of that gas, it relates to the density, and also um, the mass of it. But they are <clears throat> going to be assumed to be constant. So it's predominantly down to the temperature and the density. So in our final expression here, your mH is your mass of your hydrogen atom, and your mu is your mean molecular weight. And everything else is going to be, so your KB is your Boltzmann constant, and we know the temperature in that. So what it tells you really is that cold, dense clouds are going to be favourable to collapse. So if we've got a very cold cloud, then we're going to get a smaller value for R. So it means that the cloud doesn't need to be as big before it's unstable to gravitational collapse. And again, if we have a large density, that will also reduce the radius of this cloud before it begins to collapse. So if you have a cloud of gas which has a larger radius than this gene's radius or gene's length, then the cloud will be unstable and it will collapse if it's actually the other way around, so the, the radius of that cloud is less than the gene radius, then it's going to actually expand. And if it's equal to it, then it will be balancing one another out. So this is what we'll, you'd be looking for, really. If you knew the temperature of the, of the actual um, gas, you knew its density, you could work out whether it's going to collapse or not collapse. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, you can check out some of the other videos.